Mistaken. And then I was just wondering if there are any announcements, you know, great things people have done that people want to share. All right. So it's actually it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, um, Dr. Eric Featherman, who is an aquatic research scientist who focuses on salmonid disease and sport fish research with CPW. He is very much a CSU product having gotten his bachelor's degree, master's degree, and PhD from our department, and in fact, had the distinct honor or dishonor of being a student in a couple of my classes, including the, I think it was the very first fish physiology class I taught here, and still survived. <laughs> um, he's been working for CPW since 2011, and even though most of his research is focused on salmonid diseases, He's also worked on other things such as coming up with ways to decontaminate gear from um, New Zealand mud snails and figuring out how to induce triploidy with walleye, which is kind of cool. He is Chris Kopax, um, co-advisor for his PhD. He's on Tawny's um, PhD committee and served on Brian's PhD committee previously, so he's very involved with our department. Also very involved with the American Fisheries Society. And you would think that you know, with all of that at the local level and the western region level, he would have a completely full plate. But on the side, apparently he is the leader of the Fish Sticks softball team, <laughs> which some people in our department play in. And are you guys good? <laughs> you know, they're Fish Sticks. I suspect they have fun. And he and his wife, Tiffany, took on this interesting challenge in 2018 to hike all of the trails in Rocky Mountain National Park, and they only have 80 miles left of about 435 miles available, which he hopes to complete this year. And then I guess the last thing I would say about Eric is that in addition to being an outstanding researcher, he is an outstanding mentor, as shown by his being awarded the 2020-2021 Outstanding Mentor Award from the Colorado Wyoming Chapter of the American Fisheries Society. So with that, I'll give you Eric credit. All right, well thanks Chris for that introduction and for the invitation to come back to the department and share the research that Colorado Parks and Wildlife has been working on for the last two decades, uh, developing and reestablishing whirling disease resistant rainbow trout populations in Colorado. So today, I'll start with an introduction to whirling disease and the issues that it caused when it was introduced into the state. And then I will discuss some of the early development experiments that we ran to create the strains of rainbow trout that we are currently using. Over the past 10 years, CPW and the department have uh, conducted several experiments that have advanced our knowledge of whirling disease management here in Colorado. And I plan on walking you through a series of experiments that show you the evaluation of these fish and the post-docking survival in the upper Colorado River. So to start, uh, whirling disease is caused by uh, metazoan parasite Myxobolus cerebralis, which is in the phylum Cnidaria due to these nematocysts on the infectious waterborne stage of the parasite that uh, grab onto the fish to initiate infection. Myxobolus cerebralis is native to Europe and was first described at the German fish hatchery in 1903 after causing disease in naive rainbow trout that were brought over from North America. However, the complicated two-host life cycle was not fully described until the mid-1980s. 
So this is the life cycle of whirling disease, or myxobolus cerebralis. We'll start in this upper uh, left-hand corner here. This is the triactive myxon, or TAM. This is the infectious waterborne stage of the parasite. These TAMs are buoyant and floating throughout the water column. And when they come in contact with a live fish host, they attach using those nematocysts and uh, inject that sporoplasm, which is that glowing part in the picture there, into the fish. After being injected, that sporoplasm moves through the muscles of the fish into the central nervous system where it's distributed throughout the body and ultimately ends up in the cartilage. And young simonids are most susceptible to infection because their body is mostly cartilaginous until about nine weeks of age, depending on uh, water temperature. So within the cartilage, myxobolus cerebralis, uh, excuse me, uh, digest that cartilage to form these myxospores and replicate within the fish. And you can see that marked there by the black arrows. And the loss of cartilage results in deformities that can disrupt normal fu functions such as feeding, swimming, and growth needed for survival. And development of severe deformities usually causes fish to die within their first year of life. So once an infected fish dies, it uh, decomposes, and then as it decomposes, those myxospores are released from the fish back into the sediment where they can be in ingested by the secondary host, which is this tubifex tubifex worm. And inside the intestinal epithelium of that tubifex worm, uh, the parasite can uh, transform back from those myxospores back into TAMs, which are then released back into the water column, continuing the life cycle. So salmonids are the primary fi fish host for whirling disease. In Colorado, our most susceptible species are rainbow trout and cutthroat trout. And we have seen population level effects in both rainbow trout and cutthroat trout within the state. However, we do see fewer population level effects with the cutthroat trout, primarily because they're in a headwater streams that don't host as many two effects, two effects worms in habitat. Juvenile mountain whitefish are also susceptible to mortality when exposed to myxobolus cerebralis, but it's thought to be primarily the result of physical damage that is caused by the attachment of the TAMs and injection and migration of the sporoplasm through the skin. You can see it causes some big holes in the sides of those fish, which cause, causes plasma leakage, a loss of osmo regulation, and secondary infections that can cause mortality within a couple days after exposure. Brown trout are also, or can also be infected with myxobolus cerebralis, uh, but they usually develop fewer myxospore counts than we see in the rainbow trout and the brown trout. And we haven't observed many population level effects in the state of Colorado uh, due to exposure in brown trout. And this is probably due to the fact that the brown trout originates from Europe, which is also the home range of uh, myxobolus cerebralis, and they have developed a resistance to that over time. So signs of disease can include uh, cranial deformities, which you can see on this fish here, lower jaw deformities, opercular deformities. You can see that fish in the lower uh, picture there has spinal deformities. These spinal deformities can range from minor to severe. Uh, we also see black tail, which you can see on that fish in the middle picture, which is caused by the damage of the, the axial skeleton and neural damage. And then of course the namesake whirling behavior that occurs when the fish is startled. Signs of disease can be fairly evident when we go out into the river. So these three middle fish here, you can see are pretty heavily infected, showing cranial deformities, opercular deformities, and lower jaw deformities. And those infected fish are usually quite a bit smaller than their healthier, healthier counterparts of the same age. So whirling disease was unintentionally introduced into Colorado in 1987 and was detected at three private and one public hatchery following its introduction. Now, before we knew it had been introduced, infected fish from these hatcheries had been stocked in many drainages throughout the state. Today, whirling disease is established in nine of the 15 major river drainages in Colorado and has caused population level effects in rainbow trout populations in all of these major river systems. In some of these river systems, we saw severe dec declines of up to 98% of the wild rainbow trout populations. So this figure shows you the number of fish sampled uh, by length class from the early 1980s to the late 2000s in the upper Colorado River. And you can see in the early 1980s, we have a healthy self-sustaining rainbow trout population. All the length classes are represented, and we have a lot of those smaller length classes uh, contributing recruitment to the adult uh, length classes. But after whirling disease was introduced, we saw a complete disappearance of the smaller age classes, and without that recruitment to the adult uh, portion of the population, we saw that portion of the population drop off as well. 
causing a complete collapse of the uh, rainbow trout population in the system. And the same thing happened in many rivers throughout the state. So in an effort to reverse the declines in the rainbow trout population, uh, the state of Colorado stocked millions of susceptible fish statewide. Uh, in the Poudre River alone, 1.1 million fish were stocked between uh, 1990 and the mid 2000s. Now, despite all this stocking, rainbow trout numbers continued to decline across the state, and we also saw that uh, infected fish continued to die and contribute mixospores to the system, perpetuating the life cycle. So, a potential solution presented itself in the early 2000s when a researcher by the name of Mansour El Mount Bowie. Uh, discovered a strain of rainbow trout that appeared to be resistant to whirling disease at the Hofer Rainbow Trout Farm in Bavaria. The Hofer was imported into the United States for further evaluation, both in California and Colorado, and eventually worked into a selective breeding program by George Sisler and then Colorado Division of Wildlife. <clears throat> During these evaluations, George was able to confirm that the Hofer is highly resistant to Mixobolus cerebralis compared to some of our domestic strains. So this upper figure here shows you the mixospore counts uh, on average for the Hofer strain compared to the Bel Air strain, which was one of our domestic strains. And we use mixospore counts as a measure of infection severity. And so you can see at four, eight, and 12 months, we barely detect any mixospores in those Hofer strain rainbow trout, whereas we see an exponential increase in the mixospores in that Bel Air strain. In addition, the Hofer shows fairly rapid growth. So this is from the same experiment with Hofer fish on the left side and Bel Air strain fish on the right side. And you can see that those Hofers are quite a bit larger than those Bel Air strain fish of the same age. However, because resistance in the Hofer developed over the course of a century due to exposure in a hatchery, uh, it is highly domesticated, which causes it to lack a fright response. And at the time, the uh, re reproductive ability of the Hofer was unknown. So for those reasons, George crossed the Hofer with the Colorado River Rainbow, which you'll see as CRR through parts of this talk, to create a strain that was both resistant to whirlwind disease but could survive in Colorado's rivers. So the CRR is a wild strain of rainbow trout that had previously had excellent reproductive ability and survival in Colorado, and for that reason it had been used to stock most of our wild rainbow trout populations across the state. Unfortunately, it's also extremely susceptible to whirling disease. So when whirling disease was established in these rivers, that's why we saw those declines of up to 98% in these populations. So George's initial experiments with the Hofer and the CRR showed that it was possible to create an F1 generation fish that was, uh, showed fairly high levels of resistance to whirling disease, but further evaluations were needed. So as Chris mentioned, I did my master's project here in the department, and as part of that master's project, we evaluated the Hofer and CRR parental strains, the F1 generation cross between those two strains, an F2 generation offspring of those F1 fish, and a back cross of the F1 generation fish with the pure CRR for their swimming ability, their growth, their susceptibility to predation by northern pike, and development of disease signs and resistance to whirling disease measured by mixospore count. And the overall goal of these laboratory experiments was to find a cross of rainbow trout that could survive and reproduce in rivers with a high prevalence of Mixobolus cerebralis. And based on the results from these experiments, we determined that the first generation cross between the Hofer and CRR, known as the HXC, would be the best for this purpose. So next it was time to test the post-docking survival and reproduction ability of these fish in the field. And these evaluations, along with others that I'll be talking about today, uh, took place in the upper Colorado River. And I want to take a moment to orient you to the study section on this uh, map here. So off to the right-hand side here uh, is the town of Granby. And the upstream end of our study section is Windy Gap Reservoir. And our primary study area is a four mile stretch of river on the Chimney Rock and Sheriff Ranch. But we do use some control sites down below Byers Canyon in the Camp Bree State Wildlife area for some of these evaluations as well. So we chose the Upper Colorado River for a couple different reasons. First, it used to be the wild broodstock location for the, the Colorado River Rainbow. And we wanted to try to get a thriving rainbow trout population back in this location and potentially make it a location that we could take eggs from in the future. Prior to the establishment of whirling disease, it had an adult rainbow trout to brown trout ratio of two to one. 
Unfortunately, the fish in the river tested positive for a whirling disease in 1988, and we saw a subsequent collapse of the rainbow trout population in 1993. In addition, Windy Gap Reservoir, which is a shallow reservoir with heavy sediment loads and that is perfect for tube effects, tube effects worms, became a point source of infection in the Upper Colorado River and became one of the most heavily infected locations in the state. So the thought was that if we could get these resistant rainbow trout to survive below Windy Gap Reservoir, it was likely that they could survive in a lot of our other rivers that had lower infection levels. After the collapse of the rainbow trout population, CRRs were stocked annually into the Upper Colorado River between 1994 and 2008, but despite this repeated stocking, we observed little to no recruitment in the river after whirling disease was established. So George, my boss over at CPW, initiated the first uh, stocking of the HXCs in the Upper Colorado River in 2006, with 3,000 fish stocked that year. And then as part of my PhD project, we stocked another 5,000 fish in 2009, and 2,000 fish in 2010. The average fish of these, or the average size of these fish was 208 millimeters or roughly about eight inches in length. And we stocked fish at these larger sizes because they were less susceptible to whirling disease because their skeleton had ossified and also because they would be less uh, susceptible to predation by the brown trout that were still in the system. And all the fish were tagged with individually numbered koi tags, <laughs> which you can see here in this picture. Uh, so that we could track individual growth and survival over time. After stocking, we sampled the adult population, or the adult and fry population in the Upper Colorado River. Our adult population estimates are done using rafts and two-pass mark recapture, and they're conducted in the spring so that we can look at the uh, spawning uh, status of all these rainbow trout in the system. And the fry population is sampled using backpack electrofishing and three-pass removal sites through 50-foot sites on the edge of the river and we have four sites in that primary study location that we sample once a month june through october in addition we also collect genetic samples to determine if the hxc had spawned and produced offspring and mix of spore counts so that we could track those infection levels of those, those fish over time so i'll start by showing you what happened with the fry population following the hxc stocking so this figure is showing you the number of fry per mile uh, in july august and september and october averaged over those four sites that we sampled in our primary study location in 2009 and 2010. So in both years, we started with between 150 and 500 fry per mile in the upper Colorado River. But after that, you see a steady drop off into August and September to the point where we didn't see any fry remaining in the river in October. And this was pretty common with what we had seen with that CRR population prior to this experiment. In 2011 and 2012, we saw a slightly different pattern of survival in the rainbow trout population. Although we started with lower numbers than we did in 2009, we did see fairly consistent numbers through August and September and had about 65 rainbow trout fry per mile still remaining in the river uh, in October. And this was one of the first years since the introduction of whirling disease that we had actually seen rainbow trout fry in the river in October. So this was pretty promising. In addition, uh, we also looked at the genetics and mixospore counts of the fry produced in each of these years. Uh, this figure on the left-hand side shows you the proportion of rainbow trout fry tested between 2007 and 2011. And you can see that those CRRs represented in blue, we saw the CRR genetics decrease over time and the Hofer cross genetics increase in that population between 2008 and 2011. And with this increase in Hofer genetics, we also saw a decrease in the average mixospore counts per fish, again, that measure in, of infection severity, uh, dropping from about 47,700 uh, mixospores in 2009 to 5,500 mixospores in 2011. So although these results were pretty promising, that low level of reproduction was not enough to sustain the adult rainbow trout population in the upper Colorado. And we can see that uh, looking at this graph here, this is showing you the number of HXCs estimated per mile between 2008 and 2011. And despite that repeated stocking of those HXCs in 2006, 2009, and 2010, the number of HXC adults continued to decline in the Upper Colorado River without any recruitment to sustain the population. So overall, it really didn't seem like stocking these fish at these larger sizes was getting us what we thought we were going to get out of these fish. So prior to, uh, or along with this experiment, John Ewert had been uh, stocking some fish down below Byers Canyon as fry 
And he had been doing this since about 2010. John Ewert's our biologist up in the Hot Sulphur Springs area. And with the stocking of these HXC and fry, as fry in the upper Colorado, he had seen some pretty encouraging results when it came to their survival and recruitment to the adult population. The thought was that the, since the F1 generation fish were half hofer and half uh, CRR, um, that hofer has a history of domestication and holding those fish for a longer period in, of time in the hatchery may enhance those domestication behaviors of those fish and decrease their survivability in the river. However, if we stock those HXCs earlier in life, it may help enhance those CRR wild type characteristics and make it so that those fish could survive better after they were stocked. And John's observations supported this, so we decided to try to evaluate this more formally in our uh, Upper Colorado River study section. So this is a figure you're going to see multiple times today, so I just want to orient you to the figure uh, before I get too far into it. So this is showing you the number of fry per mile, again estimated over those four fry sites in June, July, August, and September, and October uh, in each of the years that I'll be talking about. So this figure here is showing you natural reproduction for the rainbow trout and brown trout in the upper Colorado River. Natural reproduction for the rainbow trout was estimated between 2008 and 2012. We started fry stocking in 2013, and it was hard to tell the difference between a stocked fry and a wild fry and that's why we use these natural re recruitment numbers from before that fry stocking event. So with those rainbow trout, you can see that we get a very small peak here in July at about 200 fry per mile, maybe a little less than that. But again, uh, between 2008 and 2012, we basically see a drop off to zero rainbow trout, nat naturally reproduced rainbow trout fry per mile in this system. The brown trout, on the other hand, start out at about uh, 2,200 brown trout fry per mile, even though we saw a slight decline uh, from June to October, we still end up with about 1,600 brown trout fry per mile in October. The brown trout population in the upper Colorado River is self-sustaining, meaning that we don't stock any fish up there. And so it appears that roughly higher than about 1,500 fry per mile is what is needed to make a self-sustaining rainbow trout population in the upper Colorado River. So we started our fry stocking evaluations within the study reach in 2013, stocking 100,000 uh, HXC fry in 2013 and 2014, and 250,000 HXC fry in 2015. And when we add the HXC population sampling results to this figure, which is done here in red, uh, we see that we start out with similar numbers of HXC as brown trout in July and August immediately after stocking those fish. And then we see a slight decline between August and September and a steady decline into October. Uh, ending up with about 1,100 HXC fry per mile on average when we get to October. So even though this was a little lower than our to target goal of 1,500 fry per mile, we did see a positive response in the adult rainbow trout population in the upper Colorado River. So in the first year that HXC were stocked in 2013, we estimated that there were only five rainbow trout, adult, adult rainbow trout per mile in the upper Colorado River. Uh, however, after we initiated that HXC fry stocking, we did see an exponential increase in the adult rainbow trout population going up to uh, as high as 225 or so adult rainbow trout in 2017. And then just to remind you, we did stop HXC fry stocking in 2015, but with the uh, RAF sampling gear that we're using, it takes about two years for those HXC fry to show up in the adult population, so that's why we're looking out to 2017 here. So these results were really exciting to us. It kind of seemed like we had found the correct combination of hofer characteristics in these fish that we wanted to stock, and also the correct stocking strategy to get these fish to survive in the wild. And we were about ready to call it done. And if that was the case, I could stop talking now and we could all go to FAC early. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, that wasn't the case. So in 2015, our Glenwood Springs hatchery tested positive for Renobacterium salmoninarum, uh, the bacteria that causes bacterial kidney disease in salmonids, and this is the uh, bacteria that Tani is uh, researching as part of her PhD project. So although RSL had been an issue in Colorado hatcheries in the 1950s and 60s, it had largely been eradicated by improving culture conditions. Uh, and so we hadn't really seen it in our hatcheries too much since then. In this case, it was suspected that the bacteria was brought into the hatchery from wild spawns of Roan Creek cutthroat trout. Bacterial kidney disease causes swollen and white dis discoloration on the kidneys, disrupting normal function in the salmonid, the salmonid hosts, 
And this causes a slow mortality rate that can amount to large losses both in the hatchery and in wild populations. In addition, RSAL is an intercellular parasite that can be transmitted horizontally, which is from fish to fish, and vertically, which is from fish into the eggs. And because the bacteria is actually in the eggs after they spawn instead of on the outside of the eggs, traditional dis disinfection methods are not effective at getting rid of the bacteria. So because of this, it is a reportable pathogen, meaning that it cannot be moved or stopped from a infected hatchery uh, once that facility tests positive. So because of these transmission issues, CPW, CPW decided to depopulate the entire Glenwood Springs hatchery, hatchery, which resulted in a loss of thousands of pounds of fish, including five-year classes of the Roan Creek cutthroat trout, and in, importantly for our work, the only HXC brood stock in the state. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it was kind of a big loss. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but, uh, and also, unfortunately, several years prior to this, the hatchery system didn't have room to continue raising those Colorado River rainbow trout, and so we had no way to remake these HXCs in the system either. And so we kind of had to start over from scratch to figure out what would be the next uh, uh, part of the process of reintroducing these fish. So luckily a few years prior to Glenwood Springs testing positive, Brian Avila had started his master's project here in the department. And Brian's project was based on some observations that had come out of my master's experiment. Uh, specifically, that there could be some problems uh, using the HXC when it came to outcrossing and backcrossing. So this is a graph from my master's experiment. And we were specifically looking at those F1 fish, those are those HXCs. If they spawn together and create an F2 generation, we do see a slight loss of resistance and an increase in variability in those mixospore counts. And if we outcross or backcross those fish with Colorado River rainbows, we see again a big increase in that average mixospore count in those fish and a lot of variability and resistance in those fish. However, from that same experiment, we also found that the Hofers uh, showed similar uh, swimming ability to the HXC and actually outgrew the HXC and were more resistant to whirling disease. So our thought was, why not just use pure hofers for these reintroduction attempts? Uh, we knew there were some issues with domestication, but we kind of seemed to get around that by stocking those HXC as fry. And so Brian investigated whether there was a survival difference between the hover and HXC when stocked into wild stream environments. Brian conducted his experiment in nine streams, three streams each uh, in three drainages. All of these streams were brown trout dominated, just like our big river systems were, and there were large enough brown trout and brook trout predators in these systems to consume these uh, rainbow trout after they had been stocked, again, just like our big river systems. Brian stocked 10,000 fish per stream, uh, 5,000 untagged hofer rainbow trout, and 5,000 coated wire tagged HXCs, and you can see Brian tagging those fish up here. It's just a little metal coated wire tag that gets stuck in their nose and makes it so that we can use a metal detector to tell the difference between the strains. And then Brian conducted three pass removal estimates that were conducted in two sites uh, in each stream at two, six, and 12 months post stocking to evaluate the short term, overwinter, and annual survival rates for the two strains. So looking at the annual survival rates for the Hofer and HXC, Brian found that on average across all nine streams, there was no difference in survival between the Hofer and HXC when stocked as fry. And Brian was able to replicate his field results in a lab where he stocked equal numbers of Hofer and HXC into mesocosms containing brown trout that had been starved 48 hours prior to uh, the experiment. And the Hofer and HXC fry were left in these tanks with the brown trout for 24 hours, after which all, t uh, after which uh, all remaining fish were counted. And again, overall, Brian saw no difference in survival between the Hofer and HXC, whether cover was or was not included in the tank. And this suggested to us that not only could the, the Hofer avoid predation just as well as the HXC, but also perform behaviorally similar in relation to their use of cover to avoid predation. So, given Brian's results, we decided to evaluate stocking the Hofer strain as fry in the upper Colorado River, and we started that in 2016, stocking 68,000 fish that year, followed up by 70,000 pure Hofers in uh, 2017, and 65,000 pure Hofers in 2018. So I have added the Hofer onto this graph here in blue, and despite those uh, lower numbers that we stocked in, you'll see that these numbers are about 
half to two thirds of what we had been stocking for those HXC fry, uh, primarily because of what the hatcheries could produce for us. We still saw fairly similar numbers of hofer, in the si hofer fry in the system immediately after stocking in July. However, after that, we did see a much sharper decline in those hofer numbers in the upper Colorado River, uh, steadily dropping into October to about only 200 fish per mile left in the system, which was six times lower than our target below that 1,500 fry per mile. And similar to what we saw with natural recruitment, 250 hofer fry per mile was not enough recruitment to sustain the adult rainbow trout population in the upper Colorado River. Again, we're looking at a two-year lag here, so we started that stocking project in 2016. So the hofer numbers are reflected in the adult population between 2018 and 2000, or 2020 there. And we did see a decline from that high of 225 uh, fish per mile in 2017 to only about 75 adult rainbow trout per mile in the upper Colorado River in 2020. So despite Brian's promising results uh, in his streams, it really just didn't seem like the hofer was a viable management option for reestablishing the rainbow trout populations in large river systems. And so once again, it was back to the drawing board. So for our next attempt, we went back to some genetic research that Brian and I had collected during my PhD project. And during that project, we had spent a lot of time down in the east portal of the Gunnison River, which is in the Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park. And it's a, actually a two mile stretch of, of river located down here, just downstream of Crystal Dam. And although M. cerebralis is present in the system, uh, infection prevalence is lower than many other rivers across the state. And in addition, we had seen uh, a lot fewer losses in this population than we had a lot of uh, other big river populations, only losing about 40% of the rainbow trout population after rainbow trout or whirling disease was established. And additional, additionally, natural reproduction continued to occur in this system, so these fish were self-sustaining in a lot of ways. So to give you a little history on the East Portal, um, we were stocking CRRs uh, prior to the mid-2000s, despite that natural reproduction that we were seeing in there just to provide uh, continued recreational fishing opportunities in that section of the river. After we figured out that these fish hadn't died off quite as badly in the East Portal as they had in other locations, this became a good candidate for HSXC stocking and hopefully developing a wild brood stock in this location. So after we started stocking those HXCs between 2006 and 2013, uh, we looked at the percent of rainbow trout that tested for whirling disease positive and we saw that that went down between 2005 and 2011, and that's represented by that black line there. And we also looked at the average mixospore counts of those fish in that system, and again, that also decreased between 2005 and 2011 as we stocked more of those HXC fish into the system. And then we also did see an increase in hofer genetics in the adult population, and in 2011, about 30% of the adult population was testing uh, as some kind of hofer cross fish. So Brian and I went down there into the East Portal a lot in 2012 and 2013. Uh, our goal was to sample the fry population in this section of the river to see if those hofer fish were actually reproducing in that system and starting to recruit to the adult population. So unexpectedly, all the fish that we tested between 2012 and 2014, both fry and adults, came up as pure CRR individuals. And so, we're not really sure what happened to those hofer genetics that were there in 2011, but by 2012, those fish had disappeared from the system. Despite the lack of the hofer crossfish, uh, we still, mixospore counts were fairly low in these rainbow trout fry, and you can see that in that, this graph here, looking at uh, comparison between brown trout and rainbow trout in two, the years of 2012, 13, and 14. And in two of those three years, we saw lower mixospore counts in our rainbow trout than we did in the brown trout population down there. So they were showing some fairly good resistance. And also, anytime we see mixospore counts of about 10,000 or less per fish, those fish are generally going to survive exposure to the disease and start recruiting to the population. So we wanted to test uh, what was really going on with this population and make sure that those low mixospore counts weren't just because uh, there was a low infection rate in that system. We wanted to make sure these fish were actually resistant. And so in 2014, we collected eight single male female pairs from the East Portal, and along with two families of Puget Sounds for control, uh, we exposed them to uh, 2,000 TAMs per fish. And so this is the results of this experiment. 
All right, so those are groups on here, it doesn't really matter. The important thing is, is that you can see the uh, Gunnison River rainbow in the dark bars and those Puget Sound controls, which are susceptible to whirling disease in those light bars. And you can see that uh, these Gunnison River rainbows appear to be relatively resistant to whirling disease in some of these families. We didn't even see fish develop any mixospores. Uh, several families got up to uh, 100,000 mixospores or so, but that was still fairly low compared to what we had seen with our old CRR population. And generally, the GRRs were quite a bit lower than those Puget Sounds. The interesting thing here was, again, all of those fish that we spawned to create these families and all of their offspring tested as pure CRR individuals, so we still couldn't detect any of those Hofer genetics in the system. Uh, but despite that, our GRRs only developed about 38,000 mixospores, only showed about 4% mortalities, and only 16% of the fish were deformed after exposure to whirling disease. And if we compare, compare these somewhat CRR individuals to the CRR individuals that we had in our 2008 experiment, those CRR individuals developed 187,000 mixospores per fish, 13% 13, 13 of them died, and 100% of them had deformities. So this was really interesting to us in terms of wanting to be able to use these fish, but we also wanted to try to answer the question of why were these fish resistant? Was this something that was actually going on in the river in terms of uh, a combination of natural reproduction and low infection levels that allowed the fish to develop resistance on their own naturally? Or had that Hofer uh, resistance characteristics actually been spawned into these fish in some way? And so to answer that question, we worked with our geneticists at UC Davis uh, that had identified, Melinda Bearwell, who had identified the WD Res 9 quantitative trait loci in these Hofer fish as being the resistant gene in these fish. And when we went back and tested the two uh, lowest mixospore count families and the two highest mixospore count families, we did find that Hofer resistance gene in those fish, which is represented in this figure as a, the 202 base pair in length um, gene. We also identified a couple other genes of varying length uh, that were not associated with resistance in these fish. And on average, those individuals that were homozygous 202, 202 uh, developed uh, quite a few um, less mixospores, and you can see that in all the families, and when we group all those families together, compared to those fish that were heterozygous for those that uh, QTL or did not have the gene at all. So overall, these results suggested that uh, selection had occurred in this system. We had worked Hofer genetics into these naturally reproduced fish, but we had selection working on these fish in two different directions to the point where we were trying to uh, or where we were getting that Hofer gene into these fish, but otherwise they were looking like pure wild individuals, and that made them very valuable for stocking across the state because that meant we had a fish that was resistant but had all those wild survival characteristics that we needed to be able to stock those fish out. So in 2016, we started collecting eggs from this system and uh, taking them into our Glenwood Springs hatchery, and we currently have a brood stock of the Gunnison River rainbow there, and those, these fish are currently stocked in the Gunnison River uh, down below the Black Canyon of the Gunnison and also in the Arkansas River. So even though the GRR exhibited fairly good resistance to whirling disease, that resistance was pretty highly variable among individuals. So in order to increase that resistance for stocking fish in locations like the Upper Colorado River that were infect heavily infected with whirling disease, we crossed the Gunnison River rainbow with the pure Hofer, making a cross known as the HXG. And we tasted, tested the resistance of the HXG against the GRR in an exposure experiment in 2017. And in this experiment, we found that those Gunnison River rainbows developed on average uh, 17,300 mixospores per fish, ranging from zero to 125 mixospores per fish, again, showing fairly good resistance on their own. But when we crossed them with the pure Hofer, that average mixospore count dropped down to 3,500 mixospores per fish, only ranging between zero and 38,000 mixospores per fish. And if we compare those HXGs back to those HXCs that we had been using previously, again looking at this 2008 exposure experiment, those fish developed about 9,500 mixospores per fish and range between 0 and 67,000 mixospores per fish. So overall, it looked like these HXGs that we had created were even more resistant to whirling disease than these HXCs that we had been stocking in the Upper Colorado River. So once again, we went back up to the Upper Colorado River to stock the HXG fry, stocking 46,000 in 2019, 80,000 in 2020, and 135,000 in 2021. I know these numbers are fairly variable, but 
because we were just starting our production of these GRRs in 2018 and 2019, we had very few individuals that we could stock in 2019, and it's been increasing over time. So we've been increasing our stocking over time. So the HXG is shown on this graph in gold. And again, we have really high numbers of HXG fry per mile right after we stocked those fish in July. We do see a decline in July and August, kind of similar in uh, steepness to that decline that we saw with the Hofer rainbow trout population. But in this case, it only drops down to about where we uh, had our same fry numbers that we had for those HXC fish. And then with that slight decline between August and September, we end up with about 1,500 HXG fry per mile in the upper Colorado River. So pretty, pretty much our target goal for what we've been trying to stock. So if we again go back to the uh, adult population, we started this HXG stocking experiment in 2019. So the first time those fish are showing up in the population is 2021. And we can see that between 2020 and 2021, we increased, had an increase in the adult population as a result of that HXG stocking uh, from 75 adult fish per mile in 2020 to 129 adult fish per mile in 2021. And this uh, increase in the adult population between 2020 and 2021 doesn't seem as large as some of the other increases that we had seen with the HXCs. But keep in mind that uh, this is only a result of stocking 46,000 fish. So only a quarter of those, or even less than a quarter than, of those fish that we had stocked as HXCs. So what this actually represents is better fry survival, better recruitment, and better adult survival of those HXGs than we were seeing with the HXCs. So this is where we're at at this point with the uh, development of these fish and testing them in the upper Colorado River. We'll be going back out there in 2022 and 2023 and hopefully we'll see that same exponential increase with the HXGs that we've been seeing with those HXCs. So before I finish up here, um, I just wanted to point out that we have had a large number of other experiments over the years that we've been conducting that have advanced our knowledge of the uh, resistant rainbow trout program, program in the state. When it comes to lab experiments, we've conducted many, many different exposure experiments over the years to evaluate the variety of strains and crosses that we've created. At one time, 10 years ago, uh, we had as many as a dozen different Hofer crosses that were in production in Colorado hatcheries. Uh, I also wanted to point out that Brian's dual exposure experiment that was recently conducted as part of his PhD project showed that it may be possible to create fish that are both resistant to whirling disease and bacterial cold water disease depending on what strains are being crossed. And then recently we worked with the University of Alberta on an exposure experiment looking at the immune response of the Gunnison River rainbow exposed to whirling disease and how that progresses within the first 24 days of infection. And you can see that my lab is not quite as nice as the one that Brian got to work in there. <laughs> um, so all of these experiments have helped us develop the whirling disease resistant rainbow trout science that we produce and stock. We've also conducted a number of hatchery experiments to help optimize the production of and health of whirling disease resistant rainbow trout strains in Colorado, uh, including the investigating the dissolved oxygen tolerance of these WD resistant strains. Uh, looking at the formalin sensitivity of these strains as both eggs and fingerlings, and the performance of the Hofer strain on four commercial diets. And this was one of my favorite experiments that we've gotten to conduct because after that experiment, we also got to test, taste test these fish with anglers uh, with some guest chefs at the Whole Foods kicking, cooking kitchen. So, and also this hatchery feed experiment allowed the state to finally move away from the lowest bitter feed that we had been using for the last couple decades and we now use a higher quality feed for all of our state production needs. And then finally field experiments have included both fry and adult brown trout removals. Uh, some of you may remember this from my PhD experiment uh, during which we learned brown trout removal did not increase the stocking of, or the survival of stock rainbow trout and pooter in the Gunnison rivers. This is great news for us because it meant that we didn't have to do a brown trout removal every time we wanted to reintroduce a rainbow trout population. We've also done some fingerling survival experiments at Parvin Lake where we evaluated the survival of nearly all of the dozen strains that we've created over the years. And recently we did a large post-stocking survival evaluation of fingerling and catchable size uh, rainbow trout stocked into the Yampa River. So all of these research projects have resulted in the strains being produced by the state today. As I discussed, the GRR and the HXG are currently being, being used for river plants, and in most cases they're being stocked as fry to increase that post-stocking survival. 
The Hofer by Harrison Lake rainbow trout, or HXH, has been produced using fish from Harrison Lake, Montana. They do show a little natural resistance on their own, but we have crossed them with the Hofer to increase that resistance. And these are being used as subcatchables or catchables and are generally stocked into most lakes in Colorado, though we do stock them into a couple rivers as well. We've also developed uh, some cut bows by crossing the Hofer or Hofer Harrison strains with the Snake River Cutthroat Trout. And these fish show high survival in Colorado lakes and reservoirs, especially when they're stocked as fingerlings. And some of these fish have also been stocked in the Colorado River up near Glenwood Springs. And lastly, we still do, do, do produce and stock the Hofer fish uh, primarily in as catchables and put and take fisheries where they're usually caught by anglers shortly after being stocked. So despite the lower numbers of rainbow trout due to losses from whirling disease in the past couple of decades, rainbow trout continue to be one of Colorado's most popular sport fish species. The goal of the research and management projects I uh, discussed today is to produce more, healthier, and higher quality rainbow trout for Colorado's anglers. And that's generally the goal for CPW as a whole. So in recent years, we have seen an increase in the, the production of these whirling disease resistant rainbow trout, going from only a couple thousand there in 2006, uh, peaking out at about seven and a half million in the early uh, 2010s, and in the last five or six years, averaging out to about four million of these whirling disease resistant rainbow trout fish stocked every year. And with that stocking, we have started to see increases not only in the upper Colorado River, but all, most of Colorado's major river systems as well. So the next time you guys are out fishing and you catch a rainbow trout, it's probably one of these hofer crosses that we put out there. So with that, uh, I had a lot of people to thank for helping with all these experiments. I started listing all the names uh, of people over at CPW and realized I could have made two slides just out of that. Um, so in general, I'll just thank the, all the aquatic researchers, biologists, and technicians the hatchery staff and the aquatic animal health lab staff that have helped with all of these projects. I'd especially like to thank George Sisler, who initiated the Whirling Disease Resistant Rainbow Trout uh, Development Project here in Colorado. I started working for George as an undergrad when I was here at CSU in 2004. Uh, he paid for my master's and PhD projects, and then I was able to get hired under George at CPW and have worked, still worked with him for the last 10 years on all of this research. I'd also like to thank all the folks at CSU uh, in this department, the biology department, and others that have uh, served on my committees or Brian's committees or helped with these projects out in the field in some way. And there's many other professors, graduate students, and technicians over the years that have helped that are on this list as well. Uh, but I'd especially like to thank Brian Avila and Tani Reepy, who not only have conducted excellent ex experiments of their own and advanced our knowledge of disease research here in Colorado, but have also spent countless hours with me in the field, in the lab, as my technicians, helping me out on all these projects. And then last, but certainly not least, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Daniel Winkleman, who is my advisor for my master's and PhD experiments. And I've been lucky enough to get to continue working on it with him on Brian and Tani's experiments, and hopefully many more experiments in the future. And with that, I'll take any questions. Yeah, it's primarily because they're still the most popular sport fish in Colorado. Every time we take our angler surveys, which is every five years or so within the state, rainbow trout still are the top rated fish that anglers want to go for. And so, and that's despite not having rainbow trout to catch in our rivers for the last two decades. So they want to see them out there. They, they fight better generally is what the anglers tell us. Uh, they're easier to catch than the brown trout. Um, and so in general, people want that nice, colorful, easy to catch fish out there. <laughs> um, I was wondering just, so with the introduction of whirling disease, where did it orig originate? Uh, is that known? Yeah, so whirling disease comes from Europe. Um, it's got a fairly large home range there in Europe. Uh, it started being moved out of Europe and detected in other places and 
the 50s and 60s. It went to New Zealand in the 70s, uh, so it is down there as well. Uh, in the United States, it was introduced uh, for the first time in 